fighting is like UFC mixed martial arts is basically it's static overcome by dynamic. I need to be really rigid. Please don't move me. And then all of a sudden I see an opportunity and I need to be very fluid. Like I think of the, the scene in the Batman movie where he's like getting Morgan Freeman to make his like wings and it's just like a tarp and yeah. then you put an electric current through it and it goes rigid. Yeah, totally. That's athleticism, right? But that what you're seeing there when someone can like have their arm almost broken and needs to be completely relaxed while someone's trying to rip their arm off their body. And then all of a sudden they see an opportunity to like, you know, sweep out a leg or something like that. So they have to be like very uh, like static and then they need to be overcome with dynamics. So then they need to be very explosive. It's not the most explosive guy that wins fight. It's not. It's the person that can go from the most relaxed to the most explosive as fast as possible, right? It's not the most relaxed guy that wins fights. It's not the most uh, dynamic guy that wins fights. It's the person that can go from static to dynamic in the greatest range at the fastest velocity. <laughs> special thank you to one of the sponsors of the show, and that's Timeline Nutrition. And I especially love their products because they have something called urolithin A in it. As we age, it's really important to understand that the human body becomes less efficient in some ways. And oftentimes when we think about efficiency that changes, we do think about the health of mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy generating components in our body and they can become damaged, making it harder to produce energy. Urolithin A is in MitoPure. This is a science-backed product. It has decades of peer-reviewed published science, which is why I'm so excited to be part of the Timeline team, especially as it relates to muscle-centric medicine. They have a beautiful product line that's a low sugar, non-GMO, gluten-free choices. You can mix your MitoPure berry or ginger powder, which is great if you have any digestive issues, into your smoothie. They also have a vanilla protein shake that has MitoPure. Again, this is a compound in it called urolithin A, and the majority of individuals do not make this compound. And it has a very positive effect on the mitochondria. I like to think about it as kind of exercise in a bottle. Timeline is offering our community 10% off your first order of MitoPure. Go to timelinenutrition.com slash Dr. Lion and use the code Dr. Lion to get 10% off your order. And that's timelinenutrition.com slash Dr. Lion. Use the code Dr. Lion. You'll get 10% off your order. Jordan Shallow. Let's go with that. Okay. Uh, it's such a privilege to be able to sit down with you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I think you're going to see what you're going to do is you're going to put me at a disadvantage out of the gate. You're going to overpromise and I'm going to underdeliver. Yeah, uh, no, def definitely. I mean, you are, I, I only choose people to come on my podcast that are larger than myself. Yeah. So basically just you hit the uh, weight limit. We're all good. The height limit. It's totally good. brilliant. Yeah. It was, it was actually, I saw a sign outside the door. It's like, you have to be at least <laughs> this high to go on the ride. I was like, oh, that's I've never been to a podcast like that before. How interesting. Well, welcome to the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon show. Uh, I'm really excited to have you on and, and here's why. Okay. Is you, well, number one, you're a chiropractor, which I, I don't even know if you are practicing chiropractic care that you would say that you are, but what's so unique about you is that you have a lot of um, book knowledge and a ton of clinical experience as it relates to strength, conditioning, all kinds of athletic performance. It's yeah. Pretty unique. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, uh, I don't really look outside of what I enjoy. So I, I, I guess by that doesn't, especially if you like bucket me as a chiropractor, I guess it's a little bit different, but it's the only thing I've really known is why I got into it. So that's it. I think it's what it should be. Hmm. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your backstory. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, the year you, was you were, no. <laughs> um, no. So I guess like where the, the social media career thing sort of started. I went to the University of Toronto, uh, graduated there, kin degree, kinesiology, and then moved to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Went to chiropractic college there. Um, at the time, I started consulting with a local university, San Jose State University, while I was still in school. Uh, so that was uh, 10, 10, 12 years ago now, um, would work at like uh, off season pro day prep, combine prep for kids going into the mm -hmm. NFL draft, uh, finished up my, um, finished up my chiropractic program in, um, uh, 2015, started working at Apple's world headquarters. So I was a chiropractor, uh, corporate at, uh, Apple's world headquarters in Cupertino, took on a role at Stanford University as a strength and conditioning coach. So I was working at Apple and Stanford, and then I opened two practices in the Bay Area, one in Mountain View, California, 
and the other in Dublin, California. Okay. And then started a podcast and a fitness education company around the same time. So you had a lot of downtime. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, especially, <laughs> I just, mean, I had did spend a lot of time in traffic in the Bay Area. That's one thing I don't miss. Uh, but yeah, so then I did that. And then 2017, I was doing guest lectures and education spots, usually once, twice a month. And then I thought, well, California is getting expensive. I was living out of my car at the time. And that's for, when I met you, I think. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, you, I was living out of my car when I met you. I had no uh, yeah, idea. Yeah. The forerunner out <laughs> behind the sushi restaurant in San Jose <laughs> oh was my, my home. Yeah. Uh, I was like, you know what? This is lame. Uh, I was getting booked for like two, three weekends a month at that point. And I was like, I wonder if I could stretch it out and just go from uh, guest lecture to seminar to symposium to conference or whatever and just stretch it out and see how long I could go on the road. So sold my car, packed up all my things, threw out or sold what I could, threw out what I couldn't. And then, yeah, I hit the road and I had maybe three months back to back. And I was like, well, worst case, after my three months, I'll move back in with Mike and Louise Shallow back in <laughs> Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And um, that'll be it. And sure enough, after my first weekend, I got contacted like, hey, when are you free again? Um, and then that next weekend, it was two people. And then the weekend after that it was three. And then next thing you know, I was on the road for the better part of four years straight, never had a home, just Airbnb. I think I have, I have to have a record for oh. the most amount of Airbnbs. Do you, is ever. there like credits for that? No, which sucks. <laughs> I actually terrible. got canceled from Airbnb. Oh my, my Airbnb God. Airbnb account right now is my Yeah, you know mother. what that means is you probably left it messy. No, look, I paid the cleaning fee. Can we do the whole podcast <laughs> just on this? I'm paying $700 a night in cleaning fees and they're like, you left the dishes out, canceled. <laughs> Don't even get me started. But oh. uh, yeah, so I did that for three and a half, four years. Uh, just kind of worked on the the education company on the on the side during the week and I would present in person on weekends. Uh, moved to Toronto for a bit, moved to the Middle East for a bit, just moved to Miami, took a job as medical director of House of Athlete. So now my, more of my in-person focus is clinical uh, with professional athletes, primarily NFL, like American football players. Mm. Um, and we do a combine prep as well. So it kind of comes full circle. It's yeah. kind of got me into it uh, 10, 12 years ago. So my day-to-day -day now is mostly um, as medical director of House of Athlete. So I'm in the clinic a couple hours in the morning work on my computer, do some admin stuff. And then we kind of run the education platform on the side. And when you're doing education and, and you're working with these athletes, is it chiropractic care or is it strength and conditioning? Is it, is it just making a better, more bionic human? Well, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I, I guess like everyone who hears this, if they, they probably have an ax to grind with like chiropractors <laughs> and like, Hey, you're definitely justified in that. It's part of it. Like I think the, like spinal manipulation is something that is a cornerstone to chiropractic treatment. And it's broadly used by a lot of different, um, a lot of different, uh, different sub like subsets and sub disciplines like osteopaths and, uh, PTs and even some medical doctors and orthopedists will use it. It has a place. I think not many people really understand the mechanism of correction with spinal manipulation. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they use it haphazardly and that's sort of like their, their one tool. Uh, so I wouldn't say by the conventional standards that I practice as a chiropractor, uh, especially dealing with like higher level athletes. A right. lot of what we do is on the gym floor. Like I would say if the job title, I haven't checked LinkedIn recently, but if there was a job title, of like applied biomechanist, that would probably be applied biomechanist problem solver. That's probably more how I operate. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, I, I always have like a little soft spot in my heart for chiropractors because that's kind of how I came up. But there's such an easy scapegoat in manual medicine. Like when I travel around, people are like, oh, like, what do you do for a living? And I'll just, I, I sometimes don't have the time or the patience to be like, oh, I'm a chiropractor. Because it's just like, they're always so inclined to tell you the bad story. About, like, my neighbor <laughs> went to a chiropractor and now he's a paraplegic. I was like, well, from the chiropractor? No, he got in a car accident. Like, then what are you, why are you doing that? Why did you, it wasn't the car. Uh. So I just tell people I'm a drug dealer and they just don't ask any more questions. And then it's just easier. <laughs> they get it. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. When you are um, working with these athletes, what is the, the kind of, um, way in which you work with them because I want to get to ultimately get to the point of where we're talking about stress right. and stress in the nervous system, how that all plays a role. So I'm curious as to how you would build out kind of, you know, at a high level, right? It doesn't have to be deep in the weeds, just how you are working with these people and 
Yeah, I mean, and I think why I gravitate to sort of that impromptu title of applied biomechanist is that the biggest thing that we're looking for is load management, right? Like biomechanics for the longest time was like these two dimensional stick figures, right? Free body diagrams. It's always taught by like the most boring professor in every kinesiology program. And someone takes it as an elective and like, oh, it sucks. <laughs> and it's a bunch of math, but it's not how it works, right? Like we, so we don't move through two dimensions, right? We move through four. We have like the triplanar model of like sagittal plane, frontal plane, and transverse plane, which is like flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal, external rotation. But we also have the dimension of time, right? Which is, plays a huge role, especially when we're dealing with like athletes of that caliber. So ultimately the process is centered around load management, like understanding their response to stress, right? Stress and load can kind of be seen, not, uh, load is stress, but not all, uh, not all stress is load. Okay. If we follow that train of thought. Got it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it depends a lot of times at the level that we get our athletes at, like very far along their athletic journey. Like these kids have been playing football since they were four, right? Pop Warner up through high school mm -hmm. into fairly intensive college programs. And we kind of pick them up there and see them into the league or guys who have been in the league for a long time. Uh, and at that point, it's really, it's a numbers game more than a lot of people would realize. So we have really good statistics on injury rates per position. So like linebackers are more likely to succumb to like shoulder and labrum tears and wide receivers. Uh, would, they're more likely to come to succumb to ACL issues and hamstring issues than linemen. And linemen are more likely to succumb to what's called a Liz Frank fracture, a Jones fracture. So we really look to the numbers first. And kind of see like, all right, what is the probability? We almost like money ball it a little mm -hmm. bit. Like, what are the, what is this, what is the stress of this position going to cause? Where are the weaknesses in the system? So that's like a really good starting point where someone who doesn't have a pre-existing condition. Now, are you going to find an athlete coming out of a four-year college program that doesn't have a pre-existing injury? Few and far between. And honestly, the ones that you do find are usually the ones that have the longest careers. Uh, so if you can stay healthy through your college program, that's probably the number one mm. uh, determining factor to the length of your career in the NFL. Because you have kids coming out of, you know, Alabama or uh, A and M, uh, Stanford, uh, you name it, Oregon, all the big schools, and they've already done an entire career. Right, mm. the four years they're they're massive kids that, you know, it's not like what it used to be. You have old linemen coming through at 300 plus pounds. Why do you think run. it's so different now? Money. I mean, to, to call a spade a spade, that's what it is. There's more at stake, right? There's there's more pressure that starts at the bottom, right? If you have a kid who shows prospects at seven years old, it's likely now that you could, if you get him in front of the right coaches and have the right you know, strength conditioning, the right team around them, that you can, you can really uh, groom an athlete from a young age because that's where athleticism starts like athleticism and motor motor development hmm. are they run parallel timelines with cognitive development and as you I mean, as you know they not, not even they don't even just run parallel like they intertwine and actually improve each other right? so that's a, that and that's what you're getting now like the the new student athlete is way more student than we've ever seen before like we have athletes coming out of princeton athletes coming out of stanford and you know we've had kids opt out i'll go work on wall street Wow. Yeah. And so it's, it's really interesting, but it's not by accident. It's not by happenstance that there's more, the student athletes are more students than they've ever been, but they're way more athletic than they've ever been. Those two things are intertwined. Wow. So again, it is almost like making somewhat of a superhuman or, or at least you're having this genetic potential. Would you call it genetic potential or physical potential perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Both. I mean, I think all physical potential is genetic, but not all genetic potential is physical. Wait, say that again? Right. So it, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I mean- uh, I only have one neuron. Right, fire. yeah. So Resilient, really... I mean, the, a lot of it is, you, you know, there's so much, it's so multifaceted, but there is, you when you are in a room with a really good athlete, I would say the number one genetic predeterminant to an, a good athlete is not necessarily, I think technically by the research, it might actually be skeletal symmetry. Um, but from on a boots on the ground, like on the gym floor, in the clinic, it, it's, it's probably going to be the ability to learn. Right, like we work with some pretty high end um, NFL players. I'm not going to name, yeah. I'm not going to name names, but I have my sister had her first kid, Pippa, 
two and a half years ago. And I ne- I'm not a kid. Is that why you didn't want to come over for dinner? What do I, what do, I do with it? <laughs> why like, did I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't I default <laughs> whenever I talk about kids, I just put my hands out here. But so it's the first time I ever really had exposure yeah, yeah. to and I like couldn't get out of it because it's family. I was like, oh, OK. Uh, Meanwhile, but, I invited Jordan over for dinner. I'm like, Jordan, it's like instant birth control. I have a three year old and he's not. I don't do I mean, I'm not. I'm good on that. <laughs> I should have brought the wife into town. Um, but no, so I remember watching, and it happened within the course of um, maybe a few weeks. I was in Northern Australia visiting my sister, and we had to come back for what's called pre-OTA training, which is like training we do prior to organized team uh, activities, which is like training camp for NFL players. So I'm, I'm around this thing. Sorry, your, uh, niece. your niece? Yeah, yeah, her. Peppa? And, uh, and I'm watching her like play with the iPad and like figure it out. And so I'm like watching her learn. And then I remember we had, uh, he's a running back for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So give you a little bit of a breadcrumb for the sports fans out there. And I was, we did an assessment and we're kind of going through. I'm like, all right, well, I think we should land on this exercise. I think we should practice this skill in the gym. I think this will have like high correlation to the issues you're having and the positions you're having them in. And you watch it and like a fairly advanced exercise. And uh, you could watch him. And I just thought of my niece. I'm like, oh, I get it. He can just learn really fast. Mm. Right. Because the number of variables this guy has to cycle through during a during a play is innumerable. Right. It's it's literally incalculable. So when we give what we think to be a lot of variables in the gym, he needs to just learn that really quickly. Right. But his baseline level of input for computation is so high because he's got you know, 11 guys trying to rip his head off or whatever it is that I give him a med ball and put him on one leg. It's like, at first he's a little like, Whoa, what is this? This is a novel stimulus. I mean, it's novel to him, but specific for me going like, this is the adaptation we need to make. And that's really when we, when we dive deep into mechanisms and how the nervous system plays a role in motor learning, stress management, load management, it's really just learning skills is really the fundamental uh, basis of it. And their capacity, the genetic potential is the speed or the cadence and the frequency that they can just learn. Mm. And, you know, whether it's memorizing a phone book or in this case, like memorizing and, and repatterning movements really quickly, that, that is the, uh, that is the genetic potential. Is it a bit, the ability for an athlete to learn? Wow. So the genetic potential is not necessarily initially physical it starts it's in the, the software brain. before the hardware it's without the software it, without a before doubt. the hardware yeah do you see that when um like these kids they're they're coming in earlier right so if someone hadn't been trained uh, do you find that they have like catch up to do for example if they weren't young and they hadn't been placed in these sports could they catch up it's no, not to the level now, because our net is catching so many kids at a young age that show promise and ability to excel in motor learning. That I mean, if you look at the European football, football or soccer, soccer model, yeah. you know they're getting these kids at four or five years old, right? They're no different than you know the speculations around the Chinese Olympic team or something like that. Mm-hmm. I think we're at the point now where uh, our talent identification, a talent identification, or just accessibility to sport on the whole is really putting it so that the net is so broadly cast that we're picking up talent at a really young age and we're expediting the motor learning process and hitting these motor learning milestones with such enthusiasm that I don't think if you're a kid in a college program and you haven't stepped foot in a weight room, I, 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 unless you're an absolute anomaly, and I honestly can't even think of one at, at this day and age. There were some back in the day, but I would say the standard of athleticism is so much higher now than it was, say, like 20 years ago, that I, I really don't think, you know, it, it would be like me attempting to, uh, and it literally, from, and not not a complete carryover in like the, 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 the neurological pathways, but it would be on par with me trying to learn uh, Arabic, Chinese, uh, Farsi, right, in the next year. That would be like a college kid coming in who doesn't train, trying to make a run at the NFL. That's how far behind you would be. Gosh. And did you have some kind of aha moment where you you just had this flash of insight that, that there was this C- CNS input or motor learning input that started earlier? Um, I think it came people together don't talk time. about that, right? You know, it's difficult because it's difficult. I think a lot of it right now is extrapolation from first principles, right? Where the industry seems to trend across the board is extrapolation from research, right? And I think, I think principles are going to find you much further and will probably inform where to explore with research. But I think a lot of people are 
tentative a lot of people are tentative to look into neuroanatomy and neuroscience because it's complicated right once you have memorized and rope learned your last insertion in origin you're like oh i know everything it's like uh, with the bicep inserts of the radial aponeurosis or whatever right. you're like oh i know and then all of a sudden you have this like elephant graveyard of anatomical terms that you haven't been looking at your entire career because you just don't go there, right? You can just, the, the central nervous system and to a large degree, the peripheral nervous system, and I think the, where the conversation is going to head, we'll have to address the difference between the two, is it's, what would be the right way to frame it? The peripheral nervous system and central nervous system is you just have to you have to develop a whole another lexicon right it's such a, such a difficult thing even phonetically to say some of the words so we just go eh, it's smoke bomb so a lot of people have been doing this for years they just go well you know the central nervous system and they and they run away from the conversation it's like hold on i have a question but how but why like what are the actual like neurophysiological mechanisms that we're referring to when we talk about you know, CNS fatigue, when we talk about learning, like what are these pathways we're using to learn movements? And I think a lot of times we take for granted the complexity that leads to very simple tasks, right? Like we off, you know, before we started, we were talking about uh, like watches, like really fancy watches have this complex movement, right? So they can have hundreds and if not like a thousand pieces within a single watch face, right? Like a Richard Mill, these ridiculous 45 millimeter watches have a thousand moving parts. And at the end of the day, it still tells you the time. But the people who are into watches like, wow, it's so sophisticated. I'm going to buy an RM because, because what? It's 3.30. Like who gives a shit, right? <laughs> yeah, You're yeah. still going to check your phone. Yeah. But it's the it's the it's the simplicity born out of complexity that I think is when we start to look more at the nervous system from a first principle standpoint, you can really start to be like, oh, yeah, cerebellar function and the three subcomponents of the cerebellum, all of that sounds really complicated, but it's just it's the working parts. It's almost like this is the analogy I'll use is like when when we're training or we're in rehab or with an athlete, your hamstring will talk. It's. A lot of people have been uh, just negating the actual mechanisms. Like when I, I have a German Shepherd, he's ten years old, and nine years ago when I got him, I couldn't, I couldn't dare leave the house because I'm such a dog person. He would bark and then he would cry and then I would cry and I would just come home. So I like I would just I stayed on the floor for like the first two weeks I got this dog. Like I'm gonna get nothing done. I was ordering groceries to the door. I was just living on the floor with this dog. And when after a while, my dog learned that barking opened doors. Because I would leave, he would bark, and I would just immediately just run back sobbing. So he had you trained very well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's I mean, German Shepherd. He's brilliant. He's way smarter than me. <laughs> but he learned that 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 response. So he was like, okay, if I bark, the door will open. Now, we'll go a layer deeper than the normal analogy. Because the normal analogy is like, oh, silly dog. We know how doors open. It's like, well, do we, though? Because what if you forgot your key inside? You don't know how a door opens. A locksmith know how the door knows how a door opens, right? A locksmith can come in with a pick set and move the little tumblers within the barrel and disengage the mechanism and then open the door for you, right? So the nervous system allows you to be a locksmith. I think like most of strength and conditioning and rehabilitation right now, we're sort of like the guy in between the dog and the locksmith. Go, oh, silly dog. It's like, okay, that silly dog comment is on par with like, oh, the nervous system. <sighs> that smoke bomb. It's like, no, 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 you really got to, when you start to look at rehab modalities, when you start to look at return to play protocols, when you start to look at uh, exercise progressions, regressions, adaptations, optimizations, you really need to know it down to the level of the mechanism. And a lot of times that mechanism is going to be driven here. We allocate mechanisms a lot to the external, to the structural. So like, oh, this is breaking up this, this is improving circulation. This is, you know, whatever. It's like, no, 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 that you're, you're thinking too too structural you're thinking too tangible you're thinking it's about stuff that makes sense to you in like your physical world but like the nervous system isn't that two-dimensional stick figure drawing right your nervous system almost works like lightning where it's not you know it's not the shortest distance between two points is a straight line like in a free body diagram it's your nervous system is constantly trying to find the path of least resistance right evolutionarily we're energy conservation monsters machines so we need to understand look where are what are our predetermined biases in movement how are we going to default what is our safe modes that we're going to move in and how can we leave a trail of breadcrumbs for someone to start to default to a different way of moving so we can underload certain tissues and overload other more capable tissues so uh yeah it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot and I, I but i think it's 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 sad that it's a lot 
right? To me, like I, I get sad when I get accused of like, and I don't want to say that this is from a bad, a bad way or anything, but I think it's, it's an opportunity for the industry to like start to pay more attention to the nervous system because in application, it is very simple, mm -hmm. but the level of complexity that's needed to progress through these, these, uh, these principles fast is it's a lot, right? Like if, we, if your phone broke, you wouldn't be at all surprised if you go into Apple, uh, my phone broke. Did you try turning it off and turning it on again? Like, yeah, like, well, that's all we could do for you. It's like, no, it's, it's complicated. Right. And you know, they, we can't even replicate human movement yet. Right. Like if you look at machine learning, they're having a hard time replicating responsive human movement because it's really complicated, right? right? This thing can, has more computational power. I don't mean, I don't know where Boston science uh, is. Speak that, for right? yourself. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, it's just like from a movement Yours perspective, yeah, like yeah. we can process so many variables so much faster and come to a more succinct conclusion, uh, at least from uh, like motor pattern standpoint than a computer can without a doubt. I'm super excited to bring on Thesis as one of the sponsors of the podcast. Thesis is the world's first customized nootropic company. And what are nootropics? Nootropics are nutrients found in nature or the human body that enhance cognitive function like focus, energy, or mood. I did a fellowship in geriatrics and ran a brain cognition memory clinic that was part of my job. And so when I saw a thesis and their compounds that they use, I actually had dinner with their founder, Dan. He spent years looking at the data, reviewing the meta-analyses and choosing compounds and putting together formulations, testing them with large data collections and people. You can go to take thesis.com slash Dr. Lion, go and take their short quiz. I did, but you'll take their quiz. They'll send you a starter kit with four different blend recommendations to try over the course of a month. And again, I have tried a lot of nootropics. This is a very special company with very unique blends. For the listeners of my podcast, Thesis is offering 10% off your first box to get your own customized Thesis starter kit, go to takethesis.com slash Dr. Lion. Take the quiz, use the code Dr. Lion at checkout. If you want to leverage your own neurochemistry, this is a great way to do it. The central nervous system, is there a way, so number one, as it relates to training and stress recovery and fatigue, which I, I want to talk about all those things that central nervous system fatigue, I think, isn't discussed often. Right. Um, you deal with extremely high level athletes, the elite of the elite. How does this translate over in importance for, say, a fitness person or, uh, you know, I was going to make a mom joke like the NARP, but the, you know, what? the, the NARP, the normal athletic real person. I don't know what that is. Yes, you do. No, I, I've, you I've never heard that you. term before. Yes, you have. Anyway, the normal athletic real person. I mean, stress is all relative, right? So I don't see, I don't see it being any different. It's just they've made way more adaptations of the tasks they can perform and the relative stress of those tasks is just, it's all the same, right? So uh, I, I guess the number one thing that I would start with uh, in bringing it to the, I, I feel like not is a bad word. Well, then can let's I say make, it? Well, it's not a bad word. So, okay, okay how about the, the, I mean, I would consider myself a NARP. I so, would not do that. I don't think <laughs> so I would. So it's um, a, yeah, just the, um, an, just a normal athletic person. Okay. Uh, I would start with understanding that recovery is a byproduct of load management. Number one, I think that is where people are getting misled and that's where the simplicity really starts. What does that mean? It means all the recovery modalities you can think of, right? So let's start with uh, the mainstays right now, like ice and heat, right? Cryotherapy yes. and <laughs> infrared saunas. And like, look, uh, there, there's a place, absolutely. Um, but understanding that real stress management is like you'll never you'll never be able to infrared sauna yourself out of too much uh velocity work in a week right you'll never be able to out cryo yourself um uh from too many uh, sets of heavy back squats right so there's the real stress management real recovery starts with exercise programming right and i think we've moved towards, we simultaneously moved towards these recovery modalities while we've also moved towards um, 
technology to tell us how we're, how we're progressing and how we're feeling. Those two things have happened simultaneously, right? Things on our wrist, things on our finger, things strapped to our chest are now making more of our training decisions for us. And at the same time, with the rise of all these fitness wearables, we're also seeing a rise in recovery tools. I think anyone who's been following the industry, any NARP out there would even agree that that's been those, those all right, two fine, trends. We won't use that term. <laughs> those, I, I like it. I just don't want to get in trouble. I feel like they have like an organization or something. Um, we didn't, you notice, and I think anyone would agree, those two trends have been rising precipitously, simultaneously, right? Fitness wearables and recovery tools. But it's like they're externalizing something that's internal, hmm. right? And like I'll never let something on my wrist tell me. Any good athlete, and even the NARPs out there, I'm going to try and use this term. Don't use that. I, I'm possible. like, I... Can we get a NARP counter? Like a little thing? Like <laughs> I NARP, should have NARP, never bing, said bing, that. Bing, bing, oh, bing, bing. Oh my God. So I, yeah. if we look at like these... If we look at the wearables and if we look at, like, I don't know, if I had some app on my phone, any athlete out there, even a normal athletic, real like, person, real, real like a, person, a person, yeah, a person, an okay. athletic person. If we were to grab someone on the street and we'd be like, um, hey, uh, when have you ever had your best workout? It's always like, oh man, I like just got off a plane somewhere. And like, it's, it's never good. It's never Said good. Said nobody ever. Oh, are you joking me? Every good athlete, I, whenever you hit a PR, it's never perfect circumstances. It's always like, oh, I didn't think I was going to get that. But X, Y, and Z. Is that not? Are you, an, are you, are you so far optimized oh that you my, can't adapt? Are you kidding? Are you no. So I'm like, oh, when I just saw you in Miami, I just gotten off the plane. Brilliant. Saw Steffi, worked out. Oh my God. No. I was like, oh man, I got to do these long broad jumps with yeah, her. Brilliant. But like, that's, I think that's <laughs> no the number PRs. one thing that yeah. a lot of people will defer their workouts because a score on their phone or a thing from HRV or whatever, which is great. Like, don't get me wrong. There's a place. But just as recovery tools have risen to be the the superlative thing in recovery, uh, training preparedness has also been uh, like these metrics of training preparedness have also risen at the same time. Where both of those are a moot point to a data to to a data point, they are moot to a data point that no one pays attention to, which is performance. Performance is our number one proxy in how we make decisions, mm. right? And this is like the oldest trick in the book from a strength coach perspective. Like strength coaches used to have what's called like a dynamometer, right? A grip strength yeah. measure. Yeah. And they would just get a baseline reading before someone come, just came in the gym. That was a reproducible test that was standardized that they could do. And be like, All right, what is your output today? Right. So the performance, I think, is and, and look, it's complicated, right? You need to have an eye for it. You can definitely overshoot and undershoot. But I think at, at the level of the pro athlete, then they have the resources, money, and people around them to do that. That's really where it's it should start. And it's so it's so it's the Richard Mill. It's so sophisticated. There's so much under the hood. But at the end of the day, it's still reps and sets, right? Like we're not. I'm not making up exercises. It's but it's understanding. Like look, there's a there's a sophistication that allows it to be so simple, right? It's 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 the notes we're not playing that make the biggest noise. And I think that's where a lot of people feel the need to overcomplicate things. And look, I overcomp overcomplicate the theory. Absolutely. I'll sit here and talk you know, neuroanatomy theory until I'm blue in the face. But I'm doing that here so when I'm on the gym floor, the application is simpler. Right? You can start to see the actual mechanisms. You see the tumblers in the barrel start to disengage so you can start to open up these doors and start to make these adaptations really quickly. And the for the for non-professional athlete when they think about going to the gym and, and figuring out how they're going to train, you think that the one thing is that perhaps they're overtraining um, or not recovering mm. well enough? Okay, this conversation. I would say they're under-practicing. They're under, what does that mean? Right, okay, so we can look at, we can bucket exercises on, to, let's let's not bucket them, let's put them on a spectrum. So there's gradations in between the two. Let's, let's look at exercises that are more skill-based um, and exercises that are more output-based, right? So things that are more output-based are usually like machines, a lot of uh, external reference, a lot of base support, e real easy, leg press and a squat, right? Very similar patterns in the way we go through like knee, hip and ankle movement. But the difference is one leg press is high output because we don't need to worry about a lot of extraneous muscular co-contraction. I'm sitting in a chair and I move my legs. Don't need to worry about position of my spine or my pelvis or my hips or anything like that. I can kind of just sit back and just push higher output. Squat, higher skill. Now, this is where there's like a divide of base level ability to learn. So we need to be able to address someone's base level ability to learn. And are they even in a position to be receptive to motor learning? So 
there's a concept that a friend of mine, Kyle Baxter, sort of coined it. So I'm going to kind of give him a shout out. If someone is weaker than the forces of gravity acting on them, they are always going to be in a vigilant state that makes motor learning difficult, right? So an analogy I'll use is think of a chessboard. So a chessboard and a checkers board are played on roughly the same, whatever, right. 12 by 12 square, whatever right. it is. But the pieces mean different things, right? They move differently across the board. <laughs> when we're dealing with someone who might be like weaker than the forces of gravity acting on them, like imagine, and this is difficult for, because there's, is there another word for NARP? Because normal athletic real person, I would say is, is a very small subset of the population, right? So when we deal with purely rehabilitative settings, and we're dealing with people who are weaker than the forces of gravity, like who've never played a sport. And it can be hard, and especially in like podcasting and fitness circles, it can be really hard to be physically empathetic to someone in that position mm. where it's like you, you don't know. I mean, did you grow up playing sports? I did. What do you play at what age? I mean, I don't know if you call it uh, sports, but. Uh, I ran track. Yeah, did of soccer, course, absolutely. Yeah, did dance, gymnastics. I think soccer is one of the best. Hand foot coordination is a whole another level. Um, besides, the point. it's a whole another conversation. But you don't know what it's like to be weaker than the forces of gravity acting on you. So your center of mass, which is like, how would you define center of mass? Center of mass is the point in which all the forces acting in and on your body are equal. That was pretty good. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm impressed. I was just Can we write that of, down? I was just thinking pregnancy, center of mass. Uh, yeah, there you go. That, yeah. That's like, I that's... was not thinking that. <laughs> um, so if someone's center of mass is, so I think of center of mass like fire, right? Like fire can be very dangerous. It can burn you. But if you know how to wield it, you're very dangerous, right? Uh, like if we look at really good athletes, you know, in this day and age, we, we look to combat sport athletes, right? Mixed martial artists are probably some of the more capable athletes because they have to learn so much, right? Like someone who's into jujitsu, for example, there's so many permutations, there's so much in, uh, sensory input and motor output happening simultaneously. And, you know, I always get this, my friends that are into jujitsu, I'm not a fighter by any stretch of the imagination. They go, I can use your strength against you. I was like, no, you can't, you can't use my strength. You can't use my strength against me. Yeah. Like you can't use my deadlift or my squat or my bench yeah. press against me. You can use my center of mass against me, right? They can wield my center of mass. If you've ever read the book, uh, The Art of Learning uh, by uh, Josh Waitzkins. Okay. No. Um, he talks about this in Push Hands Tai Chi. And it's a really interesting book because he knows a lot about like the learning side from like the cognitive and, and, and mental development side because he was like a chess prodigy. But he he then starts to talk about how this related to physical movement. And I didn't really understand the all the book learn and stuff. But once he got into like push hands, Tai Chi, and it was all about center of mass, I knew exactly what he was saying in the technical terms, mm. in the same way he knew about the cognitive development in the technical terms. And they're the same thing, right? So <clears throat> when we're dealing with general run of the mill people, I think to kind of circle back here, we need to first ask ourselves the question, are you weaker than the forces of gravity acting on you, right? Because if you are, we need to just get your strength to body weight ratio to a point where now we are open to learning. Because if not, you're vigilant. We see people walking on the sidewalk with their feet flared out and their spine extended. Yes. And they're, all they're trying to do is not fall over. That's what that movement strategy is there for. It is an autonomic process of increasing extensor tone, getting a ton of, of sensory feedback because they're essentially falling on their face it's like buzz lightyear like he's not <laughs> he's not flying he's falling in style right. that's people walking on the street who are weaker than the forces of gravity right they they don't delay knee extension they kind of have this hard heel strike and they kind of walk with this purposely wider base support to be more stable so that's like rule number one when we're in the gym and we're looking at assessing someone and looking at prescribing exercise and going like well how do we manage load it's like, well, what is this person's capacity for load? Because in the case of someone who's weaker than the forces of gravity acting on them, walking down the street is a stress, right? Because for me to walk down the street and adopt that movement strategy, that would be me holding a 200 pound sandbag, right? Because if we kind of, we want to work out some hypothetical math, what would it, what would it take for me to autonomic or automatically adopt that gate cycle posture, right? With a big extended spine and then the feet flared off to the side and sort of the waddle and the delayed knee extension or the no delayed knee extension and all that. Well, it would probably take me holding something really heavy here that would make the combined mm -hmm. center of mass of me and the object I'm holding so much further ahead of my body, so much out, so much further outside of my base of support that that would be the posture I would adopt, right? So then you got to realize that, look, you know, I'm all for step counts, but... <laughs> 
a step count, 10 K steps for someone who's weaker than the force of gravity. It's like, you want to grab a 200 pound sandbag and walk around lower Manhattan for 10,000 steps. So that is a fundamental thing of beginning to create a common denominator for load management is well, what is gravity doing? And I don't think a lot of people pay attention to that. Mm. Right? A lot of people walk in first day. All right, let's see how you body weight squat, not realizing that a body weight squat for someone weaker than the force of gravity acting on them is the equivalent of like you having a bar on your back and me like 300 Sparta kicking you in the spine and pushing <laughs> you because you're already falling forward and we're taking a thing on your back and pushing you forward even more. So that's like thing number one. And, and I'm trying to try and keep looping back to make sure we answer the question is, are you weaker than the forces of gravity acting on you? Can you control your center of mass? That's like pr meta principle number one. Center of mass is probably the most undervalued and overlooked concept of resistance training, period. So if we're not paying attention to that out of the gate, we are not putting ourselves in a position where we can actually be open and responsive to motor learning. Because our autonomic processes that really just stop us from falling over will override our ability to learn. Because it's like, I'm not learning this because I'm going to die is what our brain sort of says. So it just sort of shuts down the ability to create efficient motor patterns and create requisite muscular co-contractions to perform exercises that we, we wanna see in the gym. So meta principle number one. Then we kind of get into, okay, you're stronger than the forces of gravity acting on you, great. Now we need to see what do you consider, what is a skill that you'll fail technically and what is things that we can train from an output perspective. Now, I think the industry can get lost or, you know, can combining industries or conflating industries, like let's take the rehab world, which might be very heavy in the skill focus stuff. And then let's take like the more general fitness, group exercise, class, bodybuilder, whatever world over here, which might be too focused on high output, right? So we need to have a marrying of the two. And, and this is true of, uh, there's very few cases, and I don't like to speak in absolutes, but there's very few cases where this model doesn't hold true, that we're going to do some practice and we're going to train some output, All right? So the practicing of skills is all going to be relevant to how quickly you can learn and what skill level you're at, right? You don't want to practice something too difficult because you're never going to create, uh, you know, the, the skill acquisition. You're never going to close the loop on that skill acquisition process, which is cognitive, associative, and autonomous, right? So when we look at like, let's say a squat, for example, Squat, I would say for 99% of people in commercial gyms is a skill that needs to be practiced, that we should not be approaching anything that begins to look like failure. Rep speed, the speed of your repetitions, your concentric phase of your squat should probably stay fairly similar in a learning phase, right? So if you've been squatting for less than two years, I would say make sure that you treat this like practice. Because if we look at learning skills like practicing and rather than training, we can lose that one more rep mentality that grind it out and go, look, yeah, that's great for the leg press where we've minimized any sort of collateral where it's, a, it's an exercise that's suited for higher output, but you're likely going to be inhibited by the position of your spine, the position of your pelvis when you're squatting before the, the ability of your adductors or your uh, glutes or your quads to keep turning over, you know, muscular contraction. So you'll run into a technical barrier first, which is great, but let's not push and practice bad practice. Let's look at this as a skill that we are going to practice. And like any, any skill, like if I was trying to like learn a new song on guitar, I wouldn't sit there every Sunday and just play for 12 hours. I'd be like, all right, I'm gonna play for like 35 minutes a day, six days a week, right? Because if I play for 12 hours on Sunday, I'll play for like an hour good. And then by the time the eight hours hit, flight of the bumblebees has turned into smoke <laughs> on the wall. It's just like, well, there's, I've lost yeah. the, it's the yeah, yeah. there's no point, right? So that'll increase frequency of practicing skills. And then we just need to monitor local and global fatigue caused by training output, right? Like you don't need your quads or hamstrings or adductors or glutes to recover as much if we're not pushing them to a muscular failure, right? So if we're practicing these compound movements that make us think, then all of a sudden we can revert back in 24, 48 hours and practice those exercises again, right? So if we look, just that alone is a great model of managing load because, oh, I don't have to take these things that are high in muscular, high demand in muscular co-contraction and, you know, train them into the ground. It's like, no, I'd prefer it if you didn't, right? So the thing that allows you to really push muscles and create the stimulus necessary to generate or stimulate hypertrophy, let's put you in an environment where you can do that. Right. So I think that's a really good framework that a lot of people miss is like, hey, find your skill level. Some people, their skill might be 
a counterbalance wall, holding a weight out here, right? Because that helps shift their center of mass backwards so they can actually get a little bit more range of motion. It's like a, it's like a training wheels. It allows them to you know, create a more upright spine and load into the knees, hips, and back. But find the thing that's right at the threshold of your ability to perform and practice it, right? If you're really good at it, move on and practice something else. And obviously we're going into specificity of different subdivisions within fitness, but general fitness, I think having a skill component is going to expedite the motor learning process. And it's going to make your output exercises that much stronger again. Hmm. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. Head on over to Inside, like inside your body, insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. And as you are hearing with my conversation with Jordan, how important overall health and wellness is, again, you know, just as it is with training, it is like that with your blood. You really need to know what is going on and people age and perform at different rates. Um, the data is critical. How are you going to get it? You're going to do your blood work. So head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon. You'll get 20% off their entire store. You'll get a daily action plan, which is incredible, personalized guidance on the right exercise, nutrition, and supplementation for your body. Again, for a limited time only, you get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. If you are interested in performance, if you are interested in weight loss, you should know what your hormones are doing. You should know what your thyroid is doing. These are critical markers that you can test rather than guess and execute based on the result. So head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for 20% off. You know, you were talking about the kind of duck walk, and that could be at any age, right? So someone who maybe wasn't physically fit, you would see them walking down the street like that, and who knows, maybe they're in their 30s, right? Um, you'd mentioned how that they're in a hypervigilant state. Do you think that that physical movement will create stress? And I don't mean stress by uh, load capacity. I mean, like the experience of stress feeling, I, I, this it sounds a little nebulous, like feeling more stress because you are so hypervigilant. Um, yeah, it's chicken or the egg, right? Is it what led you to the point of being weaker than gravity was in an aggregation of non-physical stress? I think at a certain point, stress is, is that it is an aggregation. So I don't think it's, if you're looking at a flight of stairs when the escalator goes down, it's a different experience to your day if you could just run up and down a flight of stairs, no problem. Mm. To uh, like, you know, your cell phone bill got whatever, and your mortgage company is a new thing, and you're late for work, or you're driving to Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport, and <laughs> someone rear ends you on the highway. I which cannot happened believe to me that today. that happened. But if yeah. the escalator was broken and I was 400 pounds and I was not strong, mm. uh, uh. so yeah, I think I think there's is situations where that's the case, but I likely think that there's. Uh, that's just a, that that would be more of a symptom rather than a cause. Okay. Right. Um, thank you for that. And the other thing is you were talking about fatigue, right? Mm. And I'm really curious is, you know, when an individual, do they fail muscularly first or do they feel central nervous system fatigue first? So it, it depends on the exercise, right? Like undoubtedly there's going to be a point where, like I, I used the term path of least resistance earlier. Like I can put someone on a leg press and if you're not good at a leg press, which is, it happens, right? We can see people like try to bias their adductor in the leg press, which means their knee comes in and they're trying to extend their hip using their adductor magnus and rather than using their glute max and quad. So it's like, but once you've done enough leg pressing and it doesn't take a lot, you can learn the skill of a leg press. It's like a low threshold uh, exercise as far as skills are concerned. So when you compare that to like a squat, it's like, well, a squat's gonna break down technically much sooner than a leg press will. But it doesn't mean that we st there's still not potential to practice and I'm still not going to like cue someone's foot position or something to maintain that. So that, that question is really more contextual based off of the person and the exercise. But it allows you to like, what is your spectrum of movement? And I think being able to index exercises based off of that is super useful. Um, so like if we think of an index, like a phone book is like a classic case of an index where, um, you know, if I need to find... Uh, a person, I go to white pages, I need to find a business, I go to yellow pages. Right? So there's subdivisions with that index already. So a lot of times we just use exercises um, and we just add weight to them. Like, oh, I'm just going to add five pounds this week or 10 pounds next week. And then I'm going to do eight reps and then 10 reps and then 12 reps and then back down. And it's like, oh, okay. And then look, don't get me wrong. That's great for a lot. That's really good for those people that need to play checkers. You need to make jumps and be stronger than the forces of gravity acting on you. Go with that until it stops. So working. you're saying like that's kind of like the average person, 
right? Yeah, but I want you to look at exercises differently and I don't want you to think from uh, like a stress perspective or a load perspective that it's just weight, right? Our body doesn't respond mm-hmm. to like this idea of progressive overload yeah. should really be reframed as progressive overstimulus. And over- load is a byproduct of the constraint of the movement. So like, for example, this might land. Uh, you're familiar with like the big three? core movements. Yes. All right. So it's uh, the curl up, the side plank and the bird dog, where if we look at those exercises closely, we see that the curl up is like a sagittal plane flexion extension drill for the lumbar spine. Uh, if we look at a, a side plank, it's like a f- frontal plane movement, right? So we're like trying to stop the pelvis from moving through the frontal plane. Uh, and then the bird dog is a transverse plane movement, right? So if I have a knee here and a hand here, my body will want to rotate through the transverse plane and I'm going to stop it from doing that. So we have an anti-flexion extension drill, curl up, anti-lateral flexion drill, side plank, and we have an anti-rotation drill, uh, bird dog. So we can kind of take this now, because we have this like big, sort of uh, the big book of core exercises. But it's like, imagine, where are you from? Originally? Yeah. Chicago. Okay, so imagine going to Chicago and just taking everyone's name and just putting it in a book, (laughs) but with no organizational system. And be like, uh, all right, how do we find lion? Lion, not lions. No, lion. Yes. Right. Shallow, shallow, not, not shallow. Not plural. Write that down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, so we have this organizational structure. We need to understand that framework for exercise, right? Because a lot of our progressions in movement should be progressions in complexity, right? Or complexions in or uh, progressions in load ability. So, for example, like bird dog curl up side plank. We don't want to add weight to a bird dog. We make the bird dog more difficult by changing an exercise that is also within the transverse plane from a resisting force standpoint. So let's take, um, yeah, let's stick with bird dog. How would I regress a bird dog? It's like, well, you can't really make it lighter, you know, like put a bunch of bands around people and hang them from the squat rack. Like, no. That would be weird. It would be weird, but someone I guarantee you would have done it before. (laughs) You do a dead bug. It's the same thing, but you have a broader base of support and you have a less deviation of center of mass. So your spine is supported by the ground. So now that transverse plane intent that you're resisting against is less by proxy of the exercise, not by we're adding less and or we're adding more, taking weight away, right? We're changing the, the environment of the movement. So, and again, that's like looking at it from a mechanistic perspective where we're like, hey, the mechanism of this exercise is anti-transverse plane, right? Very remedial anti-rotation drill. How do we progress it? It's like, well, what about a bear crawl? That's a little bit more dynamic, right? We have a center of mass that's deviating outside of a base support. So it's going to be more dynamic, more difficult, more transverse plane resistance than a bird dog, which is more than a dead bug. And you could get as abstract as like a single arm dumbbell row, which is like super low down the loadability spectrum. So when you deal with someone and you're organizing exercise, understanding what their range is from skill to output, Right? And being able to go in and, and almost in flux and be able to go in and out of these and be able to touch them and then just monitor performance. Bar speed is a great indicator and you don't need an app on your phone to tell you something was slow, right? Slow is slow and fast is fast. We all objectively know that. Right. right? So I think like ownership over analyzing your own performance or as from a coach's perspective is like have some faith in your ability to like look at enough reps and be like, that was good, that was bad. Objectively or subjectively based off of qualitative criteria, like understand what tissues are being loaded, then you can understand what tissues need to recover. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, that the training education kind of supports that? Or is this, meaning like, is this something that is commonly thought about, commonly taught to healthcare professionals? No. (laughs) Okay. Next one. (laughs) uh, It's tough. Because again, like you... Let, have, let, okay, here's a here's a here's an example. Okay, have you seen uh, the AI that generates art? Uh, no. Have you? Have I? Am I supposed? What do you mean, like art? Stefan? Yeah. Steph, is that his name? Yeah. Steph. <laughs> Stefan, have you seen the AI bots that are trying to generate art? Yeah. <laughs> oh my guy! All right, it's hilarious. It's okay. like you can, t- and this just goes to show you how far off we are from robots taking over the earth. Because it's like you can type in. Um, I don't know. You could type in like Starry Night, right? And it's like the blue with the thing, yeah, like yeah, the Van Gogh yeah, piece. It. And it's just like an amorphous green blob. And you're like, oh, it's brilliant. It's, it's, but oh, it's not. come on. But it's science trying to portray art. Like I, the research or evidence base. No, I'm going to say research base because evidence 
is more than evidence, right? Evidence, the pillars of evidence being evidence-based yeah. create, you know, it's, it's going to be patient values and it's going to be uh, professional experience and it's going to be best practice in the literature. But so the research base, when I watch them put together exercise prescriptions, it's just like, it's literally, I see it in my brain. My brain doesn't even see like their, the organization of their, like day one is this and this. Day two is tibialis anterior and like, like, what are you talking about? I literally just see the amorphous blob on the AI generator. It's like, no, 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 there's, there has to be a sense of, of a enjoyment. Like let's start there. Like let's zoom out the, all the way out to the stuff that matters. Cause as much as I'm in the applied biomechanics business, I'm in the people business, right? Even at that level of athlete, like if I don't have little baby's new album on, like I'm not doing my job. <laughs> so right. bicep curl, yeah. trap, whatever. So that's, that's really when we look at research, if you're an academic institution, you're going to have to be going off of what's printed, right? And then we've kind of seen where that's led us astray in all facets of healthcare. Is health science is not on the, uh, especially applied biomechanics and, and load management and these more nuanced mm. subdivisions within like manual medicine is not on the leading edge and there's not much motivation to be, although I think there should. So yeah, if you go to, like for me, like I didn't learn any, I learned really in-depth anatomy at chiropractic college. Yeah. I was in a cadaver lab daily cutting yes. open dead bodies which Gross. is great love it it's it's visceral it, you stick it sticks with you so and it you, also smells yeah yeah yes. i couldn't eat pulled pork for like oh, six months God. after yeah, yeah yeah the formaldehyde oh. yeah the reason i asked that question is because you had mentioned all these wearables and so yeah. it's almost like they're ex you're externalizing all this data mm. And I'm just curious, is is that data also improving the way people think about training, the way that people think about recovery, the the person at home who is not a, an elite athlete, are they getting smarter at training? Is there um, ways in which they can improve above and beyond uh, what perhaps they've looked at in the past? It depends. Like people are have busy lives. So like, I don't want to impart. You don't this on, say. You know, yeah. yeah. I don't want to impart this on anyone. Cause like I, I, I could just like sit around all day and like, <laughs> think about this stuff. And then I write some of it down. Like that's kind of my whole life. But I understand like, eh, this is all well and good, but I got three, I got three mouths to feed. It's like, dude, I got a cat. That must be difficult. <laughs> but it, so there's, there's, there's a critical mass where it's like, it is a wearable useful uh, a wearable is not going to teach you much about training, but it'll be a reminder, right? And a lot of times people just need to be reminded. And I and I don't think there's a net negative to that, but there's a glass ceiling that we might uh, be running into at a certain point. And I think there's it's a natural evolution of people's getting exposure into whatever fitness is for them. So like, I, I'm going to be a little bit more like human and less like robotic neuroscience and be like, I think fitness wearables are a, a net positive because it's a, it's a reminder for mm -hmm. like, oh, I, at least, you know, a step count as potentially arbitrary as that can be. It's still movement that if that wearable wasn't there, it might not be getting measured. And if it was not measured, Got it's it. not managed that old that. So the, the wearable thing is tricky because, you know, promoting, and it's the same thing with the recovery modality market at large, like promoting that this is exercise and promoting that this is uh, recovery. It's like, no, it's not like, you know, oh, you burned 800 calories today. It's like, was I smoking methamphetamine? Before? <laughs> How did I burn 800 calories? That's insane. Like we yeah. know that, but if it's like the gold star that someone needs to work out again the next day, it's like, all right, yeah, like I'm totally cool with that. Like, you know, as long as people are like, you know, just happiness, I think is the number one indicator of longevity. And I don't have a research paper to cite that, but I have. But I think that's very astute. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you, you be around, you're rounded enough to know that like, look, I know a bunch of people who are very obsessive about this whole thing. And some of them, it's their job to be that their body is their career and their livelihood. But I know people that dropped out of heart attacks at 35 that have all, they get their blood work done, they get all this. And it's just like, have you enjoyed a day in your life? Or are you just constantly like bringing your portable scale around and weighing everything? So like, you know, big picture, do what makes you happy. Okay, like, I, think that's, I like that. Yeah, it, it has to be that. Because I think it's, it's hard to be able to go in flux from the deep science to the stuff that matters. Because uh, we get lost in Instagram posts and thinking that the deep science is the stuff that matters. Like, no, it's interesting to talk about. But at the end of the day, it says, doesn't mean anything. It's just mm -hmm. reps and sets. Just reps and sets. That's it. Um, I think I should make that into a bumper sticker. Please don't. This country has too many bumper stickers. Uh, and hats. There's lots yeah, of hats. Make it There's... red. Really, really set the tone. <laughs> lots of hats. Yeah. Um, 
what about the concept of central nervous system fatigue? Mm, uh, okay, so and if you think that that is valuable, no. Okay, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, it's usually like in my brain when I think of central nervous system fatigue, I think of like a neurotransmitters or the currency of the central nervous system. So there's some sort of depletion of those neurotransmitters or, or like cofactors that will lead to uptake of those neurotransmitters. Like I don't, I don't look at that. Uh, any more, I don't give any more weight to that as a principle than I do anything else that aggregates as a stress. Because ultimately, the only thing I'm concerned about is performance. That's the, that is the number one thing. That is the most useful metric. That is my number one training rehab KPI is performance. For everybody. Everybody. It's, per, it's performance. It, it, because it is the summation of inputs and outputs. It's the summations of, uh, of stimulus and adaptation. That's what you're going to get is performance. Is performance improving? Is it not? Okay. If it is not, we are doing something wrong. Let's go through the the laundry list of things we can change. If it is, okay, we can. Uh, we want to assume, and in certain stages, a lot of times, I think we are we are improving uh, in spite of what we do, not because of what we do. But can we make predictable improvements when we run into issues when performance starts to depreciate? Let me ask you this: Do you think that there's benefit to quote just maintaining, not necessarily improving? So, for example, someone who I don't know, is a parent of three children and they still want to go to the gym three to four days a week uh, and they don't know what to do, but they want to go and work out and they're probably not improving performance or maybe that's handicapping them and they should be really working with a trainer and figuring out what the reps and sets <laughs> and what the, uh, you know, hat and and bumper sticker should be. Right. That's tough. I mean, I, I'm so, and maybe this is old age, but I'm so inclined to lean into the human answer and away from the scientific answer. Uh, yeah, I, I would say yes. I would say yes, it's okay to maintain. Now, uh, you know, I, in my own personal life and how I deal with things, like there's, you're either progressing or you're falling backwards, yeah. right? Because the earth is still spinning and you're still getting older and we're all going to die. So you better do something. Uh, so, so but depressing. It, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a ride for sure. But like it, that principle still applies. But how, how applicable is that principle in like a normal, normal person? Like when I say normal, I mean yeah. people who just aren't in the health and fitness industry. Uh, like if someone has a nine to five with kids, like that's going to be really difficult to apply that. But I obviously think like, in situations where we can, because the opposite is also true. And this is, I think, a really good point to bring up. Uh, look at myself, patting myself <laughs> on the back for the points I'm bringing up. Brilliant. <laughs> Doing a uh, great job. Is the idea that when we optimize, optimization and adaptation are on a, on a sliding scale. And I think a lot of people, especially the emergence of health and fitness information at scale, which is great, but people end up over-optimizing. And they realize that adaptation is a skill. Like adaptation, learning how to adapt is a meta skill because it is the meta skill of learning. Wait, what does that mean? Over optimizing. <sighs> Over optimizing. Okay. So like. Uh oh, you're shifting. So this is like. <sighs> I'm just kidding. You know, we need to get a standing. Again, I this is. I, like... No, you don't need me standing because then <laughs> oh, yeah, the hands start going. All of these cameras look really nice. Um, there is a prevailing market and it's the same fitness wearable market. This is a, this is a fitness wearable recovery boots and infrared this and buckets that you go in cold water or whatever, which is like, look, that we could dive into like respiratory arrhythmias and all that stuff. But is it really going to be the thing that kind of sets you over the edge? It's like, no, a lot of times you're building a fragile state, right? Optimization, adaptation, like, Optimize when you can, but adapt when you have to, right? I think that's where people lose it is like, oh, I need to have this before I work out or I need to have 10,000 or I need to do 10,000 steps. And it's like, no, 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 you go to bed, go to bed. Like it's, it's 10 o'clock at night and you're, I can hear my neighbor upstairs pacing. Like, oh, I'm going to get my steps in. I was like, I'm going to shoot you through the floor <laughs> if you do not go to bed. Because right. the going to bed is probably going to be better for you than hitting these arbitrary landmarks. So you end up in a position with like, you know, excessive morning routines and, and, and supplementation regimens and training regimens that put you in a very fragile glass box. Yeah. And if something goes wrong, the whole thing is built up on a house of cards and then it all topples over. So I think like, and, and if you have to hardwire that into your programming, where it's like, look, I'm going to wake up once or twice a week and train at 5 a.m. Why? Because it's going to break my dependency on these things, right? I love I, that. I actually really love that. It's... It's it's a very it's a very dangerous. I don't want to say dangerous. Dangerous. It's not like someone putting a nine millimeter in your mouth, but like it's it can. It's just a very counterproductive narrative. And I hate the word narrative. 
but uh, conversation that's being sold at large to justify the wearing of X, Y, and Z or the taking of X, Y, and Z supplements. Mm. And it's just like your body sorts it out. Like you're going to be okay. And like no one's, there is a small fraction of the percentage of people on the planet that are going to really benefit from hyper optimization. Um, but even them on their best day, something can go wrong and they're totally, still, but it's and it, and like, it's, it's, it, it's like, it, think it's, about the military, those guys. Yeah. I mean, listen, we had one guy and he's a pararescue and we've had a bunch of seals, obviously no chain. Things are not perfect. In fact, if they were be shocking, yeah, that's they still have to perform. And I think it's more about the delta mm. than the peak in the valley. So the lowest point doesn't matter. The highest point doesn't matter. It's the distance between the two points. So if we look at like, and you could you could almost run a parallel conversation between like performance and uh, like parasympathetic and sympathetic, or even like uh, those who are more fat adaptive to those who can tolerate carbs. Like it's, you know, if you're a keto person and you're only eating like primarily fats and protein, you stay away from carbohydrates and you end up with some level of like, intolerance you can't really go in flux from like being able to maintain a particular body composition or maintain lower states of inflammation in any particular diet so if you're hardcore in keto and you don't ingest like a lot of like starches or i don't really know what their deal is but let's say it's starches that sounds right <laughs> okay. and then you ingest some of that all of a sudden like you're on the shelf for three weeks and it's like oh man my stomach's really been going through it's like well what was the point of your thing right where you have someone who can't tolerate fat for whatever reason or on the flip side if you have someone who's very sympathetically charged right like very high uh like high tone athletes and you have someone who's like going to be more parasympathetic right sort of like the gardener in the war and the warrior in the garden type. totally the, the, if you mapped all of those people on like, okay, this person's highest, highest here, but they're only lowest, lowest here. And their delta is the space in between that on the graph. And you took someone whose highest point wasn't as high, but their delta, their range, and be able to go from high to low, from carbs to fats or sympathetic to parasympathetic. And the speed by which you can traverse that, that delta, the difference between those two points, it's the space in between and the velocity you can move in between them that matters, not so much the highest peak of I'm grateful to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. And much in line with our talk about muscle, we couldn't get away with talking about muscle without talking about joint health. And that is why I'd recommend you heading on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Line and check out collagen. So collagen is very important for joint health. And, you know, anecdotally, I hear a lot of patients do very, very well on a combination of taking collagen protein and fish oil together. I think that this can be very beneficial. And first form, collagen contains 50 milligrams per serving of dermaval, which is a phytonutrient-rich complex. And that enhances and helps maintain levels of elastin in the body. Collagen is a critical building structure we know, uh, while elastin is responsible for that elasticity. Head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lyon. Check out their collagen. They have different flavors. I think that this is really great for joint health and also skin. It is low temperature processed. I use it. It mixes very, very well. I know that you're going to love it. That's pretty, I mean, I had never thought about that. It's just because <laughs> it, it's a it's a meta relationship that we see all the time, hmm. right? Where it's like you, the, the people need to be in the hyper optimal states, but then those are never the people that win. Right. It's the people who have an ability to like, like uh, you see it in the most, the smallest expression of athletic movements. Like uh, fighting is like UFC mixed martial arts is basically it's static overcome by dynamic. I need to be really rigid. Please don't move me. And then all of a sudden I see an opportunity and I need to be very fluid. Like I think of the the scene in the Batman movie where he's like getting Morgan Freeman to make his like wings and it's just like a tarp and you put an electric current through it and it goes rigid. Yeah, totally. That's athleticism, right? But that what you're seeing there when someone can like have their arm almost broken and needs to be completely relaxed while someone's trying to rip their arm off their body. And then all of a sudden they see an opportunity to like, you know, sweep out a leg or something like that. So they have to be like very uh, like static and then they need to be overcome with dynamics. So then they need to be very explosive. It's not the most explosive guy that wins fights. It's not. It's the person that can go from the most relaxed to the most explosive as fast as possible, right? It's not the most relaxed guy that wins fights. It's not the most uh, dynamic guy that wins fights. It's the person that can go from static to dynamic in the greatest range at the fastest velocity. Wow. Do you, uh, this is like more of a hypothetical question. Do you think it's like that in life? Yeah, I think so. 
uh, yeah, and I like I think training is a really good microcosm because it's physical learning and the outcomes are so tangible. Right? Cuz we can look at people learning skills and objectively and subjectively be going that looks better and that is heavier, that is faster. Right? And we can and the best part is you can teach it. And it's okay, this is going to get you want to get metaphysical? I'll, <laughs> I will go there. The number one principle and like we haven't talked about this yet. The way you teach someone how to go there is teach them where they are. And that's like, you want to open that book and be my therapist? I'll tell you all about my childhood. But it's, that's the number one thing when we want to, we have someone who's like no longer in hypervigilance state, they're stronger than the state of gravity. We want to ascend their ability to uh, learn skills or, or ascend their, uh, the hierarchy of skills to learn. And we want to expedite that process as fast as possible. We need to have them be aware of where they are in space. Mm. And Again, it's the Richard Mill. It's the complexity of the nervous system that leads to the simplicity of the application. It's we look at the central nervous system primarily. There's like a part of our central nervous system called the cerebellum, it's like this walnut-shaped projection off of the posterior aspect of the brainstem. There's three components of the cerebellum, and the whole the cerebellum is like your movement brain, right? So rhythm, coordination, timing, tone. Like people that are. If you ever worked, I don't know why, it's cause, maybe because I used to work with construction workers, but like, I always think of like a construction worker, come in manual therapy and you put your hand in their hip and it feels like this. This person is like, smokes four packs a day, like oxidative stress, you know, center of mass, out, they're not super, super strong. And it's like, they're on high tone. It's their brain is contracting everything. Everything is rigid. They have no range of motion. They're super stiff you know, historically we looked at that and go, oh, that's a local tissue level problem. Stretch it and mm. bone roll it or whatever. There are something it. And it's like, well, no, because it's all, it's all centrally mediated, right? So the cerebellum kind of enters into this conversation of going, okay, how do we then, what are the principles by which people learn, mm. right? Well, they need to know where they are first, right? And we can kind of tie this back to the uh, skill acquisition model where it's like, do you play an instrument? Definitely not. Okay. So like guitar, right? So you have six strings on some guitars and it's E, A, D, G, B, E, right? So I need to know if I'm looking at sheet music, I go, okay, I want to play uh, an F note. I, I look at a thing and then in between the first two lines, there's a circle. And I look at that and go, that's an F. In between the two lines, if there's a circle in between those two lines, that's an F. But I haven't made a sound yet. I just know this thing. I just know the circle equals F. And I go, okay, that's, cog that's a cognitive phase, right? I know that when I see it. Then there's an association that's made. I go, okay, I'm going to put my first finger on the first fret of the E string, and then I'm going to hit the string. And mm, no one pitched me on that, but the, <laughs> it's F. I've now associated that, right. right? And then when I'm playing Smoke on the Water, Flight of the Bumblebee, when I see the little circle, I can just autonomically go, pop, put my finger right to that first fret, right? So that's like, but I need to know where it is first, and then I need to know where it needs to go, right? So a cerebellum takes care of that for us. So like we have these three subcomponents. One is the vestibular cerebellum, the spinal cerebellum, and the cerebro cerebellum. Uh, spinal is the most interesting. So maybe we'll end there. If Can I do this? Of course. Okay. Put on a pot of coffee. Step <laughs> on. No, this is like, this is the probably like the most fun thing to conceptualize because we take for granted how complex movement is. And if we really start to look at the ones and zeros, we can be like, wow, we can hack and I, I, I hate to use this word on a podcast, especially a fitness podcast, because I don't want anyone to call me a biohacker. Well, it's not technically a fitness podcast. Okay, it's so a me you're medical. There you go. A medical. Perfect. There you with, go. Uh, yes. Okay. With a chiropractor. Ooh, <laughs> that's bad. Um, but you can look at movement when you start to look at this, like the ones and zeros of movement, right? So we're really looking at like command line movement source code when we start to look at this, because there are things that we do all the time. Like I just scratched my head. Why did I do that? Right. But it, I did it. And we just take it for granted that why did that happen? But there's reasons why that stuff happens. So if we look at uh, like motor learning and sort of pertinent to this conversation, cerebellum, posterior aspect of the brainstem, three major components, vestibular cerebellum, spinal cerebellum, cerebral cerebellum. Let's start with the cerebral. So the cerebral cerebellum kind of has two major components. It has a component that tells us where we are in space and a component that tells us where we're going. So anyone who ever uses the word like motor pattern, Right. So motor patterns, I want you to think of like uh, zip folders on your computer. Right. So if I, if someone is sending me like a very large video file, they're going to compress it. They're going to send it to me. I'm going to unzip it and I'm going to open it on my end. So this like five gig video doesn't take four days to send over an email. Right. So that's like, we have those in our brain for every activity we could imagine. 
uh, like an activity we've performed or activities we've seen. Like for me, like a backswing, I have to, I usually go home once a year to some other friend's bachelor party and they make me golf. And it's <laughs> the worst three hours of my life, but I've done it for the last like seven years. So I've, I don't know, maybe played a hundred and something. How many more friends do you have that are getting married? Not that I'm back to the top of the order. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're just going through again. I'm like, dude, I had one was enough. That's my limit. But it, somewhere in my file folders, in my cerebral cortex, in my pre and primary motor planning areas in my brain, I got, I have these old dusty folders. And every year, I, I like dust them off, and I go, oh, okay, we got to we got to depolarize this series of events. And that's my nine iron and my driver and my putter, whatever. And so that's one part. So the cerebral cerebellum gets input from your cerebral cortex, which has all these motor patterns, which are heavily influenced by things like visualization. It's so like Chicago, University of Chicago years ago did a study about um, the power of visualization improving sport performance. So they looked at three cohorts of basketball players, uh, two hours, one group went out and shot, uh, the other group went out and visualized shooting, and the third group did nothing, they were control. And then after the, I think it was a two week, um, a two week study after the two weeks, so something like a 25% increase in those that were shooting, a 21% increase in those that were visualizing and something like a zero point, whatever, like a, a non-statistically significant improvement of the other group. But it's like just visualize, not actually going through it. And that's polishing that file, right? That's, that's uploading new iterations into that Dropbox folder in your brain, into that compressed zip folder. Now, obviously, if you can go through the process of recalling it and putting it back and recalling it and putting it back, you're going to get a little bit better, but that's not nothing, right? That's not a, that's not a marginal uh, improvement. The other part of the cerebral cortex or the, the cerebral cerebellum, sorry. So we get these inputs from the cerebral cortex. We also get input from things called mechanoreceptors. And this is going to be really important because we have four major mechan mechanoreceptors. Right, so we have Pacinian corpuscles, Meisner's corpuscles, Ruffini endings, and Merkel's discs. Collectively, they're responsible for relaying transmissions of vibration, deep pressure, skin stretch, and light touch. Those are like the major ones, right? And But like, let's unpack that because that's, think about uh, going and getting, have you ever had kinesio tape on? Like you, yeah, okay, but you're, I, I want a royalties check when an <laughs> AT tape company finally gets on board with this. There's a bunch of different proposed mechanisms of correction of, of kinesiology tape, right? If any of you watch the Olympic Games, people are kind of covered in it, especially the London Games, the volleyball players were mummified in it. We have a nerve ending, that a free nerve ending in the skin that transmits to the cerebellum and collectivizes within these three subsystems and allows us to, to create almost like, think of a motion capture. That's a really good way to look at what the cerebellum does. Like being on a sound stage somewhere in LA and they're trying to make Avatar or Lord of the Rings or something like that. And there's an actor that's like Andy Serkis in Gollum uh, in Lord of the Rings, for example. He was wearing a, like a lycra suit and a headband with a bunch of little like ping pong balls all over it. And then it fed into a central processor. So Andy's standing on a fake rock in LA, but the computer picks up all of this relative, these relative data points, creates a, a, an avatar and then just skins it with the, the character that they want. So it doesn't look like him, but it moves the way he's moving, right? Our brain does that. Our brain needs to know where we are in space and true, when we talk, talk about exercise of a skill, true like mastery of a skill, and it's, it's so hardwired into the language, but we don't see it, is like being able to do it with your eyes closed. And we'll talk about this in more yeah. detail. Yeah, curious, what, what, what would that be? Well, yeah, it's so like behind the neck, like a behind the back pass or like- Like I know, think I've mastered driving, but that's like not something- Yeah, let's, okay. let's not do that, <laughs> especially after the morning I've had. But so here, so cerebral cerebellum is reliant on taking in this mechanoreceptor activity. So think of these mechanoreceptors, like little leads on our own suit, rather than having like a, a lycra suit on, we have our skin, right? So it's always there. We have these mechanoreceptors that are giving us input into our cerebellum and allowing us to go into central processing and be like, Hey, you know, I am not looking at my heel right now, but I know it's there, right? If you're watching the world cup, you think they're looking down at the ball? No, they know it's there, right? Because a lot of that is tactile, right. not all of it and not the most important pieces, but that sensory input is so important. So those mechanoreceptors feed into the cerebral cerebellar pathway, right? So we have kind of an amalgamation of, Hey, where are you? Where are you in space right this very second? Merkel's disc, Meisner's corpuscles, Bassinian mm -hmm. corpuscles, and Ruffini ending. And they feed up into the cerebellum. And the interesting thing is the speed by which they transmit. It's transmit at like 30, or 0.35 to point, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, 35 to 75 meters per second. Just like those at home might not be familiar with like those relative speeds. Uh, at max velocity, Usain Bolt is likely running 17 meters per second. 
right? Because if he does, logically, if he does 100 meters in less than 10 seconds, right. but he's not running the first 30, 40, 50 meters, that is max velocity. And when he gets max velocity at like 60 or 70 meters, it's probable that he's running 17, maybe even faster. So these things are going to your brain faster mm. than Usain Bolt. On an interesting side note, if we have these four mechanoreceptors, no susception, the idea of pain transmission to the brain. And now pain is very complicated. Pain science is very complicated. For sure. But pain has a lot of redundancy backup. So the idea of mechanical pain, sort of pertinent to this conversation, no susception breaks down into fast pain and slow pain. Fast pain, probably two to 20 meters per second. Slow pain, 0.5 to two meters per second. Which means if I put my hand on the stove, that transmission is getting sent to my brain slower than constant mechanoreceptor activity to my brain, which means our body really wants to know where we are, wants to know where we are more with more importance than wanting us to know that our hands on the stove, right? Like that, that pain that we feel, like we feel the heat before we feel the pain, which is crazy. And that's like, that just goes to show you how important it is for us to know where we are. And that's not even the most, uh, that's not even the fastest transmission of a sensory input into the brain. Cause we haven't even talked about the muscle yet, which is like where I think we should lend most of the time in the conversation. Are we, so are we, are we dealing with the levels of inception? Cerebellum, three components. Cerebrocerebellum has a cerebral cortex, which has your files of where are you going? Right? Where are your Dropbox folders? What are your motor patterns? What are your golf swings, your tennis swings, your bicep curls, your calf raises, all that? That stays there. Where are you going to go? Simultaneously getting fed in with mechanoreceptors, it goes, where are you? Where are you right now? So we know how to adjust your position to go to these places, right? So that's cerebrocerebellum. Vestibular cerebellum is a, is a pathway that mixes in your eyes and your inner ear apparatus, so your vestibular apparatus and your inner ear, so like your, your true balance center helps you keep your eye fixated on a target while you execute a movement. Golf swing, classic example, you need to look down while the rest of your body looks this way. Do you remember you brought up driving? Do you remember learning how to drive? Yeah. Do you know the story? I have one. Uh, mine's not a very good story, uh, but mine's go ahead. terrible. <laughs> so I was driving in a parking lot on Riverside Drive with my mom. She would take me three or four times a week after school. And I, I grew up in like a pretty ghetto neighborhood. Sorry, is what it is. And... Four o'clock in the afternoon, maybe she got off work, picked me up in our Chrysler Sebring convertible. And I would do, I remember doing a lap. It's probably the third or fourth time we've gone out. My mom was like, very mom, like, you're going to be doing this till you're 20 and you're not going to drive on roads until I'm dead. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And we did a lap and I saw this car. And in the car, there was two people and there's a bunch of cars parked wherever. And I like just paid special attention to these two people. They're like, teenagers in their 20s and I do a lap and every time I do a lap they have less clothes on and I was like oh, oh my God. <laughs> no this is the worst thing ever and then sure enough like by the time like the sixth lap there's just an ass cheek <laughs> on the car and I'm like you're with your mom too which is like oh I can't even watch like movies with sex in it I can't I leave the room. I'm 32 years old I'm like it's just too strange so I pulled out into the road I was like I'm out I, I choose death <laughs> And I pulled it, but I remember this because it makes me now, as like I learned about this and I apply it in training, I think about the vestibular cerebellum because I remember what happened when I pulled onto Riverside Drive. And I was checking my blind spot, but as I checked my blind spot, I shifted into oncoming traffic because I didn't have an ability to associate my head position with m movement in my body, which is actually a huge cornerstone of athleticism, right? Our ability to gyroscopically move our body around our head and our head around our body is like a fairly unique property to visually oriented animals. An owl, amazing. Like you, can, you ever see someone hold like yeah, a, totally. and they do this? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad that you got that <laughs> reference. Yeah, no, totally, the owl thing. Uh, yeah, it's called- uh, Excuse me, I have a three-year-old. What do you think we watch? Right, brilliant, exactly. I love it, I'm coming over. Uh, it's called your vestibular ocular reflex. So that, so inter integrating vision, right? A lot of times we're too dependent on vision uh, for learning. It's our crutch, because we're such visually dominant creatures, which is great. Vision can be a great tool, but it's a better master. For example, I learned how to squat when I was 15 years old. What does that mean? Squat. It's a bet, It can be a good tool, but it's a better master. Right. So I learned how to squat when I was like 15 years old. But in any commercial gym, and this is probably a good takeaway for the my NARPs out there. <laughs> You're never going to uh, let me live that is, It's Kara's fault. Kara taught me that word. Okay. I'll blame it on it. Yeah, that sounds like a Disney, yeah, yeah, she taught me fits. that word. It's so. a really <laughs> California thing. Um, so I learned to squat at a commercial gym. And if you're listening to this and you train in a commercial gym, keep this in mind. So I learned to squat in front of a mirror. All squat racks in all commercial gyms across the world, and I've been to all of them, they <laughs> face a mirror. And I was like, I thought I was pretty good and like could squat a decent amount of weight. 
And then when I moved to California, I started training at a powerlifting gym. No mirrors. No mirrors. And I realized for the longest time. Unless you go to Mark Bell's gym. He now has, pulls out a mirror. (laughs) The internet's changed. (laughs) Uh, But if you go to the powerlifting gym, in this case, so when I went to Boss Barbell Club, I I was there. And I realized really quickly that, oh, I, I never knew how to squat. I knew how to fix my squat. Right. Because I was constantly, I was dependent on that visual crutch. I had no idea where I was in space. Right. I needed the visual part because I couldn't see where everything was by feeling it. Right. So then we'll talk a little bit on the last pathway, what that final and most important piece is. So I, a lot of people are too visually reliant on uh, seeing things without feeling things. Right. So allowing uh, that the, the cerebro cerebellum to like, play, like visualize these things in your brain with your eyes closed. People all close your eyes and visualize. Well, why? Because if you don't close your eyes, you're just going to use this and this is going to take over because we're so dominant. Vision is the only sense that's embedded into all five lobes of the brain. Right? Our occipital lobe is completely designated. So we have one lobe that's completely designated to vision back here. If the optic nerve goes straight from the eyes right down to the occipital lobe. And then in you know frontal lobe processing and cognition and parietal lobe and temporal lobe um, and cerebellum, they're all embedded into, uh, vision is embedded into all of them. So it becomes really important. So that's vestibular cerebellum. And the last one is spinal cerebellum. And mind you, these are all aggregating together right. simultaneously in real time to give you a motion capture, to give you a playing avatar of where you are in space in your, in your subconscious. So you can move voluntarily and involuntarily at the same time. So the spinal cerebellum is really its main purpose is to relay two things. And that's going to be, so we kind of use like nociception up here, mechanoreceptors here, and we have Golgi tendon organs and muscle spindles, right? And this is where I think of when we talk about learning and we're learning exercises and practicing skills, if we looked at muscles in this endeavor as sensory organs, we'd be way further along in our ability to adopt these models of training and we would get way better results much quicker in practicing and learning these skills. Because a lot of times people are like, oh, muscles are dumb, they just move from insertion to origin. It's like, no, muscles are the, the, the primary conduit of sensory input back into the brain, primarily the spinocerebellar pathway. So when you think about uh, the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon organ reflex, they're essentially, um, they're very similar in the way that they're stimulated. One is like the muscle spindles and then the muscle and the Golgi tendon organ is in the tendon. And these two things are going to relay their transmissions up into the spinal cerebellar tract, into the cerebellum uh, uh, at large at 120, 130 meters per second. Mind you, putting your finger on the stove is 20 meters per second, Mm. right? So our wantingness to know where we are in space based off of like an assumption that a hierarchy can be created uh, based off of velocity of transmission. Like I, I run into this problem all the time satiation is like a really slow late thing because forever no one ever died from not eating or from eating too much that's changing now (laughs) but you know it's like ah we'll get there when we get there and like 20 minutes later like oh my god why did i do that (laughs) but your body wants to know where you are in space right away and muscle spindles and golgi tendon organs are the 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 primary thing that's going to relay into the brain the fastest so mechanoreceptors are great they go into the cerebral cortex get relayed through the cerebral cerebellum but where a lot of times people miss and we're half there stretching people love to stretch right from a manual therapy manual medicine standpoint when something hurts people come to me go what's the stretch for this and sometimes it could be x y or z because golgi tendon organs you know there's difference between static and dynamic and ballistic and all that but what i want people to take away is what should I stabilize? Stability is like a really, it's almost like a taboo word, which it shouldn't be. Our body has a wantingness to not fall over. We have a lot of autonomic processes. Ever since we've become bipedal, like because we walk on two legs and we're one of the very few land creatures and creatures that do that, we have a tendency to want to topple over. We have a lot of autonomic processes that stop that from happening and allow us to be biped ambulatory. So when we think about stability, stability is essentially from a muscular perspective, it comes down to the muscle spindle. Muscle spindles from a, uh, a sensory receptor standpoint are the most abundant sensory receptor in the body. And a lot of people don't realize that there's 50,000 muscle spindles in your entire body. There's like 600 muscles and that includes right. muscles in your face. So you don't have any muscle spindles in muscles of your face. But like when you walk, for example, you have muscles on your lateral hip. And, and there's no such thing as a stability muscle per se, because every muscle has this, this autonomic loop where they go, oh, okay, so, you know, something is stretching. Like, so let's talk Golgi tendon organ really quick. Like if I'm stretching my bicep, 
right? So my shoulder is going into extension, my elbow is going into extension, and my wrist is going into pronation. My bicep tendon, if it feels a stretch, it will do like two things primarily. It will in inhibit the agonist muscle, the bicep itself. So it'll like allow that to relax. And in loaded situations, it will activate or stimulate the tricep to contract. Both of those things are meant to alleviate tension on the bicep itself. Muscle spindles work a little bit differently. Muscle spindles have an, anti or an agonist uh, motor, uh, an agonist, uh, f uh, inhibitory cycle. And they also have an agonist excitatory cycle, which means rather than stretching like a Golgi tendon organ, where we're inhibiting the agonist or the bicep and activating the tricep, we're inhibiting and activating the bicep. Mm. It's, tr it's an on off switch, right? So if you've ever seen someone, a really good example is get someone to stand on one leg and watch their foot. Just do this. It's not, it's not weak ankles. There's not enough musculature in the ankle to make it weak or strong to any sort of meaningful, any, right. any form of meaningful way. What you're seeing is actually the hip turning on, these muscles turning on and off because they're feeling a bit of a stretch. Think of um, a muscle spindle like, uh, like a finger trap, right? So we have two, like we have what's called an interfusal muscle fiber and wrapped around this fiber is like a finger trap. That, that finger trap, that the actual device or the, or the spindle spindles around mm -hmm. what's called an interfusal muscle fiber. These are non-contractile elements of muscle, right? So if I'm standing on one leg and then I start to fall over, my you know, piriformis, glute max, glute med, are gonna start to stretch. All of a sudden, this stimulates into the nervous system, into the central nervous system, into the spinal cord, going, hey, this is, this is happening, what do we do? It's like, well, that's a muscle spindle. It's stretching, we should probably contract it. So through like a really quick feedback loop that doesn't even go up to the brain, it goes right back into the muscle and goes, oh, muscle is stretching, and then it contracts all of the surrounding extra fusal muscle fibers. Those are a contractile element. So what you're seeing with the foot that's shaking, it's like, oh, you got really, you got really weak ankles. It's like, no, 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 you don't have weak ankles that need to be strengthened. You have an unstable hip that needs to be stabilized, right? So we need to be able to understand the components of center of mass and base support, put them in an environment where that's a skill they need to practice. And it's just at their leading edge of being able to overcome it. If someone can't stand on one leg, am I going to load them up with a dumbbell in one hand and make them hinge? No, I'm probably just going to be like, hey, here's like a dowel. Can you stand on one leg now? Right. And then we're going to slowly manipulate those two things. And what that'll do is that that will create an awareness that'll send that transmission because as a muscle spindle loops back to contract or loops back to relax, it's sending a signal up the brain telling, hey, we're doing this here. And then the brain goes, what, what is here? Where is here? And it starts to be able to put all of these little motion capture things in, in line with our mechanoreceptors, in line with our nociceptors, and be able to create a high resolution motion capture image of where your body is in space. And this will allow you to operate at low tone. Right? This will allow you to be more efficient in the way you move. It'll allow you to learn skills faster because you know where you are. And that's the fundamental, the fundamental components to motor learning is that, knowing where you are and knowing where you're going. Hmm. Do you think that these components, <laughs> it's so, it's so uh, interesting. I'm sure Stefan is like, whoa, mind yeah, blown. He's like, oh my God, let me go home. Um, <laughs> uh, do you think that these things change as you age? As the muscle changes, do these mechanoreceptors change? Yeah, I mean, I don't have hard evidence, but I would see like a plasticity. I would assume a plasticity, not necessarily at the muscle. Uh, I would assume it would probably be more neurological first. Um, because it, it is it is learning. It follows the tenets of learning. And you know, when we see, like, just like me, if I tried to learn, I was living in the Middle East for a little bit this year and, like, trying to learn Arabic. I was like, and I watch, you know, my friends, my friend's daughters are both bilingual in French. And they can just pick it up like that. So I think it's it's more of, like, a, a, like a central plasticity type mm -hmm. thing. If I had to make an assumption, I, I'm going to be totally honest, I don't work with you know, in the NFL, in a, it stands for not for long. So like the oldest <laughs> athlete I think I work with might be like my age, like 30, right, right. early 30s. But I would assume that in, de in uh, working with, you know, older in the 40s, 50s, 60s, that the process takes longer, but it, it doesn't take as long as people think because a lot of times right, what we're doing now in training like elderly populations is we're barking and we're thinking we're going to open doors. Right? We're really not looking at the ones and zeros. We're not, we're not writing proper exercise prescriptions because we're not writing proper lines of exercise code. 
right? We're just like, oh yeah, like, you know, having someone, I remember I trained a client who was six foot eight and he was 73 years old, which is like, you want to talk a poster child of a slip and fall? That's it. Yeah. This guy's center of mass is way far from his base of support. He lives in a one bedroom place in Palo Alto. Doesn't have to go up or down stairs ever. Like this is a concern. He drops, you know, broken hip, fractured rib. He's dead in 50% of them are dead inside of six months or a yeah. year. I think this is the statistic. Yeah. So it's like, all right, well, he is unstable. Structurally, he's un he's a he's a tree. He's huge, right? So he has all of these forces. And this is where we need to just look back. Is he stronger than the forces of gravity acting on him? No. What do we do with him? Just get him strong, right? We practice a bit of skills. Like the, I think his first squat variation was me holding his hands to a high box squat. I was like, yeah, let's sort that. And then we put him on a leg press and then drop that right down. So I, I think like anything that there's going to be, the age is going to have a deleterious effect on our ability to learn. But I think if we understand the mechanisms by which we learn, we're nowhere near uh, with our current paradigms around resistance training across any population at the point where we've optimized motor learning because we're not looking in the right place. We don't, we don't as at large in the market or in the industry, really go into the granular details, the, 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 the mechanisms turning the tumbles to unlock these adaptations or writing the source code to, to run higher level operating systems for, for movement. We're, we're just not there yet. So yes. Do you think it'll ever be standardized? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it's, it's always people that like, I remember reading like Charles Poliquin research as a kid. That's what got me into doing like what I do now. And he was talking about cluster training 26 years before the research on cluster training came out. Um, you know, I, will there, is the academic institution too big to topple over? Probably. I always think there's going to be a, a validity for academics and a need for it. Um, but with that, and I mean, you're familiar with like the, the publication system, machine, ruse, input any word you want to use. Um, I think there's still some net positive. I just think that, oh, okay, people will have to extrapolate from first principles and for then people in academia to be like, oh, let's explore this deeper. And then, you know, like Poliquin, be like, hey, cluster training works. He's like, yeah, I know. I've won like 180 Olympic medals since you guys were researching it. So it's, 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 so it's, I think in the, from what I see, it's not being done, but with the results you get from it, it's fairly predictive that, okay, this might not be precisely the mechanisms at play, but we're way closer than any other model that we've been mm. using up till now. Could there be one or two exercises that people could always do? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I, I semi-prepare for this question. <laughs> I think uh, lunging. Now, obviously, there's like strength to body weight ratios. Can't Are you strong enough to push yourself up? Like I And I've literally done this. If I've reverse band lunged people before which means like put bands at the top of the squat rack and hold on to it. So as you sink down and your muscle needs to do more work, the band's making you lighter essentially. So I think lunges are, are great because you know, bi bipedal ambulation, walking is like a fundamental rule book or like safe mode, like gait cycles, are super interesting cascade of like muscular co-contractions and structural, func structural functional interactions. Uh, and it's how we've evolved to move. So a lot of force production comes down to tenets of, of gait cycle. So I would say lunging is just, let's see what you got. It's really like, it's really uh, pushing the outer limits of gait cycle per se. And there's different loading parameters and all that. But if I would say one exercise that people should probably do forever, it would be some unilateral lower body movement. I think lunges are great because of the dynamic. They're, you're exacerbating gait cycle to a point where it forces you to, to learn that and appreciate that as a skill. Because you, when you see people walking with their toes out and their spine extended, you realize, that, oh, people can walk bad. That's interesting. So lunging would be one. Uh, I, I honestly, I would stick with that. Then once we get into rib cage, like there's, it's, it's too variant based off of like structural presentation to give a broad based prescription. But I would say lunging would be the one I would mm. recommend for sure. I love it. That's a, a great takeaway for people. One. You got one. <laughs> you got one. An hour and a half and we got uh. one. But yeah, no, the, the, the matter principle is like, look at exercise like learning, right? And, but it doesn't all, some of it's work and some of it's practice. Practice some stuff that you're bad at. Understand that you're going to get better. You know, don't eat, have your training principles for that, those exercises not be training principles, be learning principles. You want to like learn how to learn, read pedag pedagogical research, learn how people learn. Don't learn how people train when you're trying to learn, right? If you want to learn how people train, then apply that to this, <coughs> excuse me, to the stuff you're training. 
right? Your, your leg presses or your quad extensions. And maybe one day when you're really good at that, you could probably train that to failure and you could squat to failure and get big legs or whatever. Right. But I think that if we're trying to, uh, salvage this, I think understand where in your training, you can practice skills, increase the frequency, right? And use the principle of interleaving, right? I'm not going to cram for a test the day before I'll study little bits every single day. I'll interleave those bouts of learning. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to rein it in because I, I mean, I, I, I think if you understand or you can attempt to understand the the complexity, th what makes this sophisticated is that the complexity it, it, it drives more simplicity. Right? Like if you come down to Florida and you watch me train NFL players, like you're like, I don't get it. Exactly. <laughs> that's the that's the best part. Mm. You know, you're taking these uh, oftentimes not thought about concepts and bringing it to light for people because oftentimes when you know many people think about training again they're just thinking about reps and sets but they're not thinking about the nervous system input which it yeah. seems like that's again what you said the software before the hardware so i think this is really valuable i mean the whole point of this podcast is to have transparent conversations of really interesting experts talking about things that are going to be very valuable. <laughs> I hope we I hope we check <laughs> so, some of those boxes. Um, Jordan, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Um, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Uh, Instagram, it's at the underscore, 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 muscle, underscore, doc. Um, all the education stuff, www.pre-script.com. If you ever want to talk, shop, email me, jordan at the muscle doc com. If you're ever in South Florida, just stop by House of Athlete. All right. I'll, be there. I'll uh, put all these links in and, and thank you again. Thanks so much. Thank you.